Good evening, everybody, both here at Salford University and those of you watching online. My name is Professor Robert Shepherd, and it's my great pleasure tonight to introduce Scott Thurston on his elevation to the Professoriate as Professor of Poetry and Innovative Creative Practice as he presents his inaugural lecture, Kinopoetics, an Embodied Journey Through Poetry, Dance and Therapy. Scott is going to speak and demonstrate that journey himself, so I'm not going to offer a resume or assessment of that progress. In any case, I can speak for poetry and innovation, but not for dance and therapy. But I do have the perspective of having known Scott as a good friend, excellent student, supportive colleague, experimental fellow poet and enthusiastic collaborator over a long period of time. I know of no other case where somebody has studied both A-level and been supervised for a PhD by the same person. <laughs> but I do know, and I don't know whether that's actually a good thing, but I do know, I do know of the robust processes that are used by universities to elevate professors and the necessary past successes and achievements that are essential to meet the rigorous criteria adopted. I also know that some of Scott's achievements are highly visible. What could be more visible than dance? But some are quite invisible. I'm thinking of the work Scott does day to day as a teacher, lecturer, research supervisor, coordinator and administrator, and his work as an editor of the academic periodical he and I co-founded, the Journal of British and Irish Innovative Poetry. To take just one, what might be thought, quite minor part of that, as a writer of references for students, for courses and colleagues, for teaching posts, Scott's work is exemplary. Never have I come across such detailed advocacy on behalf of candidates written with obvious care and time consuming attention. And I know that the care and attention is replicated his marking and supervision of research. As editor of the journal, I also know that he really does get down with the nitty gritty of responding to articles in preparation for publication. Hardly anyone sees this work. Invisible labour, as it, though it is most important to the visible life of the university and the visible viability of an academic journal and of academia itself. Somewhere and within these professional commitments, his scholarly work on poetics, his pedagogic innovations in the still evolving subject area of creative writing. Most importantly, his own creative practice, which includes poetry and movement, gets done. Now, don't forget the extension of this work, working with Joanna and others into therapeutic practice. How he manages still to be one of the nicest human beings I know is a mystery, perhaps even a miracle. After all, academics as a tribe do have a bit of a reputation. I'll move on. Move on to a compelling concluding anecdote. Many years ago, as Noel Coward always used to say, many years ago, so last century, long before all I've just mentioned, Scott and I were sitting in the Alexandra pub in Wimbledon, chewing over the poetic fat, perhaps trying to foster literary techniques or strategies for what would suffice. I turned to Scott and asked, what are we going to do about the poetic revolution then? Before he could answer, before he could even gather his thoughts to answer, a fellow poet who shall remain nameless burst into the pub, bursting the bubble of our concentration and proceeded to commit conversational nuisance, as Samuel Beckett once put it, oh, all over us, long enough for the question to die a death. We've often wondered what we would have discussed, decided or even plotted that evening if we hadn't been interrupted and whether it would have mattered. One answer to that question, though perhaps we are dealing more with poetic evolution than revolution, lies in what we are about to receive. Scott's embodied journey through poetic, dance and therapy, kinopoetics. Scott Thurston. Poetic 
Thatcher. Kenna poetics is a um, compound from Greek words, kenine meaning movement, poetics to do with making. So we're about movement making, but I'm about much more than that as well, it's seeing movement in other forms, whether that be poetry or therapy. So I'm going to begin at the beginning. Robert's stolen some of my thunder with this. Um, I began writing poetry when I was 14. Um, I was very lucky to meet three amazing teachers in very quick succession, and they all sent me on a terrific path of discovery. The first was Sue Appleby, my English teacher at school, who knew I was writing before I'd even told anybody, even myself. I was writing poetry and uh, she sent me on a creative writing workshop at my local tech college which meant I got to get days out of school and I met Jan Dean, um, a poet and now painter who was very uh, helpful, supportive and signposted me to Robert when I was deciding where I was going to study my A-levels at college. And Robert introduced me in turn to the whole vibrant experimental poetry scene in London. This is the late 80s and early 90s. And there I began to encounter really remarkable poets, many of whom I still follow, some of whom I've been lifelong friends with, many of whom I've written about and interviewed. Um, early Freer, Adrian Clarke, the late great Bob Cobbing and his wife, Jennifer Pike Cobbing. Geraldine Monk, Maggie O'Sullivan, Alan Fisher. You may be familiar with some of the things I've said about these writers. So poetry was the bedrock. It's kind of what's gotten me into this whole journey to start off with. I should have said earlier, this lecture's brought to you today by the number five. There are gonna be five parts, and this first part I'm calling activation. But what's happening also, as you'll notice, is that I'm I'm dancing, I'm dancing the five rhythms, and uh, that's also providing a kind of structure. And um, five rhythms is a movement meditation practice I first encountered about 20 years ago, just when I was beginning to work here at the university. And it was invented in the 60s by a dancer called Gabrielle Roth. She was brought up on the East Coast. Um, she was I guess intending to become a professional dancer, although she was very interested in theatre as well and had considerable spiritual gifts that she was exploring. But she had two severe knee, knee injuries, which mean, meant that she had to kind of find a different direction. So she went west and she found herself, I think sometime around 1965, 1967 at the Esalen Institute in Big Sur in California. And there she met a great deal of really influential people in the human potential movement and began putting her movement, her dance movement to, to different ends. She actually started working with people with severe depressive symptoms and inviting them to put their bodies into motion and noticing how this seemed somehow healing and relieving of those symptoms of being, of being stuck and in low energetic places. And she developed a whole cosmology, a kind of life cycle of birth to death, a, a vision of how energy moved in five different patterns. So at the moment I'm dancing the rhythm of flowing, which as you can see kind of does what it says on the tin, long continuous flowing movement, it has a physical focus in the feet. There's also an emotional map of the rhythms. So Flowing is actually connected to fear, but it's not really about necessarily feeling fear or expressing fear, but kind of being in the energy of fear, which has both light and dark aspects to it. So my encounter with five rhythms is, I'm calling it activation. I've kind of devised my own map in a way, my own answer to the five rhythms in this talk. An activation for me, and you'll see later, it's also a principle in therapeutic practice of different kinds, 
is the way in which I connected with my body um, when I fell into the dance. And I think it was a really important antidote to all of the heavy intellectual work of the daily life of the university, which Roberts alluded to in terms of the invisible labour that many of us academics do. So this uh, kind of experience sort of woke me up in a really kind of profound way. And I began to sort of explore how this could be a kind of companion to the work I was doing at the university. Um, and that began a journey of 20 years discovery. So alongside many other activities, digging deep into the dance and seeing what it could offer. So that brings me to part two, which I'm calling translation. So I'm moving now into the rhythm of staccato, which is a rhythm of starts and stops, dips and lines, kind of energetic, directional. The focus is actually in the hips and the emotional tone is anger. Again, not necessarily expressing anger, although that can be part of it, um, but feeling the energetic shape of anger. So I'm thinking about this section of translation, about moving from one form to another. When I first started dancing five rhythms, and this is about paying this conscious attention. I'm not sure I've introduced you to all of the five rhythms yet. We're in staccato. The third one is chaos. I'll introduce you them more fully in time. Um, the fourth is lyrical. The fifth is stillness. You go on a journey with those rhythms in a class, usually held by somebody who's playing recorded music, and you're with a group. You might be moving in and out of different dynamics of pair work, of working with small groups, working with the whole group. And the attention that I found this could help give to my movement, I felt this is like reading and writing poetry. That was the first insight and one that I spent the next 10 years thinking about. And I did get an answer eventually, and I'll tell you about that in a moment. But one of the other things that was happening was beginning to do, to find ways to sort of turn this into a research project at the university. Robert was really helpful because he put me on to an amazing poet called Jackson McClough, um, an American poet based in New York, um, active right the way through the 50s and 60s and beyond. He wrote a book of poems for dancers in the mid 60s when he was associated with a really vibrant context called the Judson Dance Theatre, where you had poets, painters, dancers, theatre makers, you name it, all coming together and making new forms of multimedia art. So this is a really good place to look for examples of poetry and dance working together. And I discovered McClough had also written a series of cards for the dancer Simone Forti to use in improvisation. Um, I met a fantastic dancer and writer called Kenneth King, who actually danced in the first production of The Pronouns in 1967, when he was just a teenager. We've corresponded now for many years. And I met the younger generation of writers and poets to be influenced by the Judson dance kind of explosion. Uh, Sally Silver's a dancer and Bruce Andrews, a poet, were both artists I got to interview and learn about their uh, processes through. So I went to New York, I got to see the pronouns being performed, um, put together by Clorinda McClough, McClough's daughter. I got to take a workshop with Simone Forti um, in her 70s. She does an amazing practice called Logo Motion, where she improvises speech and movement at the same time, kind of like what I'm doing now. And um, started to learn a lot more about this rich history of practice. And at the same time, I was also getting into my own, um, kind of expanding my own physical repertoire, studying movements like contact improvisation, 
Feldenkrais, Alexander Technique. Almost want to kind of get into these a little bit more. Um, Iyengar Yoga, uh, some outgrowth practices of the five rhythms, um, movement medicine, and also open floor. And I have a lot of teachers to thank along the way for my introduction to those practices who I'll mention later. So it was a practical, but also a bit of an intellectual and academic kind of inquiry, trying to find out what's possible here in this translation. Why am I so fascinated by this relationship between maybe doing something like this? Why does this feel like poetry somehow? Why does this energetic movement have a quality that I recognize, but in another form? And I was really um, lucky once again to be advised by a fellow Five Rhythms dancer called Celia Simpson to look at the work of Daniel Stern, who wrote a remarkable book in the early 2000s called Forms of Vitality. Stern was an American psychologist who made his name through doing really psychoanalytic work, studying the communication between children and their caregivers and how that was feeding into the development of personalities. Fascinating work, really detailed and complex. Towards the end of his life, he started to think in a very big and ambitious way about how we experience life itself. What are the kind of building blocks of how we inhabit the world, how we feel ourselves to be alive and present within it? And this is another number five. He came up with five elements. You can't really separate them out. They're all kind of mixed up together. But he named movement really as the preeminent one. Then you have time, then you have space, then you have direction and intentionality, and you have force. So if I'm thinking about just isolating a movement in the moment, just really bringing it down to something very simple, it's unfolding in time. So it's maybe one, two seconds to get where it's going. It's unfolding in space, so it's a certain height above the floor a certain distance from the wall, a certain distance from the back of the room and so on. We can pinpoint it in space. It's also unfolding with a certain amount of force. So I can kind of do it in quite a relaxed way. I could change the level of force. I could make it much more tension and explosion. And these are the kinds of words that Stern was interested in because they conveyed something of the vitality dynamics that he was interested in. And in terms of intentionality or, or direction, it looks as if this movement could possibly be about to do something. So I might be going to grab something over here or switch off a light or say hi to somebody. It's kind of, there could be meaning behind this movement. So this was the kind of eureka moment for me. I thought finally, after 10 years of wondering about what's this connection between dance and poetry, I had a language for understanding it. It was something about what was going on on a lower level, as if you like, a more um, profound level that somehow poetry or music or dance is always drawing on those vital experiences of time, of space, of force, of direction. And they show up in those art forms in different ways. Because I was bringing poetry and dance so closely in conversation, I could almost see the same underlying meanings going out into these different uh, art forms and then communicating. And Stern's work became very interesting to certain kinds of artists. He worked with the theatre director, Robert Wilson, who's actually bringing a play to Manchester next week, um, coincidentally. Um, he worked with the dancers Steve Paxton and Yvonne Rayner, and they were absolutely fascinated by how he was making films and slowing them down to one twenty-fourth of a second so that he could really observe the tiny granular detail of these interactions that he was interested in between children and, and their caregivers. So this got very interesting for dancers. They'd never seen movement like that before and they were drawn to it. And Stern collaborated with Wilson on a piece called Bob's Breakfast. They did what's called a microanalytic interview so two minutes of Wilson trying to remember everything that was in his head 
as he was having breakfast. Sounds like an extraordinary thing to attempt, um, but very, very detailed, really trying to get down to that moment to moment movement of thought. And Wilson said at that particular time, he had the impression that his thoughts were just going around in circles, but not really getting anywhere. And I think we've all had days like that. <laughs> and what he did, however, was make it into a theatre piece or even a choreographic piece called Bob's Breakfast, where he put an actor on the stage running around in huge circles and doing exactly that. Finding a sense of that circularity, but it doesn't get resolved. It doesn't become a whole circle. So that's that idea of translation, the movement or the vitality dynamics of those mental motions in the head now becoming uh, projected onto the stage into kind of physical movement. And that was a really important starting point for me. I've probably completely lost to Carter now, but I'll just <laughs> finish with that. So part three. meaning. So I'm trying to dance this in the rhythm of chaos, which is going to be quite difficult. Um, chaos is a, about kind of letting go, a sort of release. Um, the physical focus is in the head. The emotional tone is sadness because of that sense of, of letting go of things that have maybe been encountered in the other two rhythms. But I'm interested in meaning because at this point I think I began to get, you know, I, I couldn't give, give up this inquiry. It was getting deeper and deeper. So I started seeking out professional dancers to work with because I realised if I didn't do that, I was only going to get half of the story. And I was very lucky to be able to meet um, a dancer working in my own department or my school at the university, Sari Myers Slee. We began a, a wonderful collaboration for five years together, having conversations, writing articles, working in the studio. And we eventually made a collaborative duet together and hosted a festival of like-minded folk who were experimenting with bringing language and movement together. And so alongside that, I found myself studying with Billy Hanna, um, a remarkable Belgian poet and dancer who combines these practices in an improvised way um, with, a, with a beauty and grace that I've, I've seldom seen anywhere. And I got the opportunity to work with her in London and in Berlin and also online during the <coughs> pandemic. And Billy really taught me to try and think of poetry and movement as not separate at all. But if you really get to the right place, there's no real distinction. And I think I learned in her workshops in London in particular that I was beginning to develop my own movement vocabulary. That actually I now knew how to say things in movement that were kind of new, as if I was now becoming a dancer and beginning to articulate in a way, um, I, I guess with beginning to get that little bit of extra skill. So I was beginning to feel like I could say something with my body as a dancer. So what does that look like in practice? Well, I realise one of the problems of dancing as a poet is that you have to memorise the poetry because you can't really, you know, read stuff that well when you're in motion. And I started with one short poem. It was the only poem I could remember of mine at the time. And it's actually the first poem in my selected poems. It has a kind of special place and it's called Slight of Foot. I wrote it when I lived in Poland in the mid 90s. And it just seemed ready to ready to go into movement because I, I already had it embodied. It meant I could begin moving with it, begin experimenting with it. I'm going to share it with you in a moment. But one of the things I discovered that really excited me was that when I moved with a poem, I could find new meanings in it started to become a way of expanding the poem, discovering different things. And you might think, well, 
if you don't know what meaning is already in your poems, then what are you doing? But actually, that's not quite the way I write. I write in quite a, if you know my work, quite an impressionistic, abstract way sometimes, because I'm curious about how suggestive language can be, even to myself as I'm writing. I'm interested in its potential for movement, for change, for discovery. And there was a very unassuming phase in, phrase in this poem, it's simply the words quarry, canteen, can join together. I seem to remember when I was writing the poem, I was reading a, a Jack Kerouac novel and he'd been walking in the mountains and he descended into a quarry to fill his water canteen. So that was the image. Somehow it got into the poem because I was just drawing on different images that were suggestive to me. When I performed it, and this was, I had a lovely time working at the Liverpool Improvisation Collective where I studied contact improvisation with Mary Prestige and Mary Pearson and worked with the vocalist Steve Boyland and he helped me a great deal to put together a little programme of works in progress. So I performed Sleight of Foot and right in the middle of it I got to that phrase and I suddenly realised it means something else. Another association came into being. I was then thinking about a canteen of the cafeteria kind that I visited in South Wales at a mine rather than a quarry and I was in search of my ancestral roots in that part of the world. I remember I went into this canteen and they had a photograph on the wall of the same building um, 40, 50 years ago and I realised it hadn't changed a bit and I was thinking also oh, my great uncle would have known this canteen more or less how it looks today. And I somehow happened upon that meaning in the moment. And what surprised me even more was that everybody in the audience could see it too. So I thought there's something about this, another layer of meaning, what this practice can potentially bring to me. So I just render that poem for you now. Slight of foot. Where you hung up traces. Coax her to rest. Solid glimpses. Cultivation labour to wait as a pearl grows. What rocks your skin enlarged again, gleaming over soil spits, quarry canteen, hooking over to this venture one-sided figures gleam. Part four. Part four is called, I can't remember what it's called. <laughs> it's brought to you by the rhythm of lyrical. Part four is about structure. <laughs> so I was building up a level of kind of experience and practice in performing with dancers, thinking about how to make meaning now in poetry and dance together. And when you get all that material together, you want to kind of put it together in a way that you can present it. So Sari and I made our performance um, was called Wrestling Truth. It did involve actual live wrestling. And um, it was a great pleasure to work with Sari on that. We brought together sort of all of the ideas that we'd accumulated, all of the meanings, and put it together into, into something that kind of made sense, a container that held all of those meanings. And around that time, I was also beginning to develop a new 
area of collaboration. Joanna and I had thought for many years that we wanted to work together. Joanna's my wife, if you've not, if, if you've not met her before. And um, we are working across poetry and therapy broadly. And dance was always our kind of common language. We began dancing, well, actually Joanna started dancing six months before, started dancing five rhythms, um, six months before I plucked up the courage. It was actually the um, introduction of our dear friend Josie, who uh, first let us know about the five rhythms. So thank you to her. <laughs> Things would have turned out very differently otherwise. And um, so we, ex we started exploring how movement sort of embodied or could kind of contain like a lingua franca, a, a go between language, um, between poetry and therapy. And at that time we decided, well, we really need to get someone in who's a movement specialist. And the five rhythms obliged in an extraordinary way. We, we met Vicky Kaku, who's become a long-term great friend and collaborator in a five rhythms class in Liverpool. Um, we danced together for a good few months without ever knowing anything about each other or what they did. Um, but we had wonderful conversations and encounters on the dance floor, whole conversations in movement. And I think that was a very good basis for a project which has now gone on for over 10 years. But when Vicky and I started working together, it was about exploring this connection between movement and language, but from her point of view as a dance movement psychotherapist. So she had a very particular clinical interest in how to bring language into relationship with movement in that particular area. And she saw an opportunity. And Vicky had written an extraordinary article, co-written a, a, a very high level review of all of the literature about the use of dance movement psychotherapy for treating depression. And there were four really big ideas in this and she felt they needed to be shared more widely. It was a fairly kind of specialised uh, academic language that she felt let's try and use a performance, use an artistic way to communicate these research findings to a wider audience. So she recruited me and the dancer and choreographer Julia Griffin to create a piece using these ideas. And the four ideas, and in a way this connects right back to, back to Roth, effectively pioneering a form of dance movement psychotherapy in the late 60s at a time where other clinicians and dancers were beginning to explore that use of movement. Um, we started to kind of unfold them. The first is, and I've borrowed some of these ideas for the structure of my own talk, the first is about kind of increasing vitality, so recognising that importance that Gabrielle Roth noticed if someone's depressed, if you can get them moving, it's a very powerful way of changing their physiology and can have a big impact on those depressive symptoms. The second part is to do with the relationship and so in therapeutic terms, many different forms of therapy rely or benefit on the quality of the relationship between the therapist and the client. And in terms of the third phase was about this building of meanings, how in movement therapy, we discover metaphors, images, symbols in movement. So we might be making movements that have particular you know, metaphorical understandings. We can interpret them and use them to build up a picture of somebody's sense of themselves in the world. The fourth phase is narrative, what I'm calling structure in my talk, bringing all of those meanings and ideas together so that they kind of make sense. They become a story, perhaps a new and more empowering story for the person who's receiving the therapy. So Julia and I worked with that and we recognised, of course, that those, um, those principles were absolutely intertwined with um, what we would encounter in artistic practice. You go into the studio and you need to activate yourself. You need to 
raise your energy levels in order to be able to work. We'd never met before. Um, we had six weeks to make our first show, so we needed to make our relationship work. And, and we did brilliantly, and we've worked together since as well. Um, so the relationship was key to that artistic work happening. The moment we were in the studio, we were making stuff, we were improvising, we were coming up with images, symbols, ideas, just playing about, and then we were choosing the ones that were most suggested to us, that really kind of spoke to us. And then gradually we accumulated all of those materials until we had a structure. We had a, a duet, a 20 minute duet, which we called Getting Out of Your Own Way. So I'm not sure we really ever communicated those research findings in a very obvious way to audience. But what we did do was discover how close that particular kind of therapeutic practice was to artistic practice. And that realization really helped to inform the next project, which grew out of that. Um, the work we did with Julia was called Dancing the Blues, and then it morphed into Arts for the Blues as Joanna got involved and worked together with Vicky to create a new clinical model for creative group psychotherapy, which we've been working with ever since. And I'll say a little bit more about it in the, in the next and final section. I haven't really told you about lyrical, but I think these lights say it all really. It's kind of a, a movement associated with joy, physically located in the hands and a rhythm which is often, I guess, the harvest for me, the celebration of all of the work that's been done navigating through the fear, anger and sadness of the first three rhythms. So. To close this section, what structure has meant for me is that I've started to make my own performances. I was sort of forced in the pandemic. I couldn't get out to the studio to collaborate with other people. So I started making my own scores, if you like, or simple structures for performance. And the score that I use most commonly now is a three part score. It begins with improvised movement, which is what you've been seeing. Um, it moves into then improvise movement with a memorized poem, so like the sleight of foot. And then the third phase is to both improvise the movement and improvise the poem, which is the hardest bit. And I'm still learning how to do that, but I'll give you a little sample just of that last part before we move into the final section. Has it made sense so far? What have I forgotten? I'm sure. I'm sure. I'm sure I've forgotten something. <coughs> There's nothing inside this circle. Or there's everything inside this circle. I'm so grateful you're here. I want to think about what's outside the room. I don't want to think about what's outside the room. I'm here. You're here. Perhaps that's enough. Part five. Integration. Brought to you by the rhythm of stillness, which is not an absence of movement. The physical cue is the breath, the emotional note is compassion about how breath is connecting us out to the world and back in. And integration is a really important principle in lots of therapeutic work as I've learned, so I 
built it into my own creative structure for the process and the story that I've been through, which is still unfolding. And by integration, I think I want to talk about a number of different things in which our body of work with Arts for the Blues is really coming to fruition. We've received several important grants over the last few years, which have meant that we're now starting to train people in the NHS to deliver Arts for the Blues. And Joanna is indeed offering it to her patients in the NHS as we speak. We've kind of come full circle in a way from our earliest explorations to something which is now going out into the world in a different way and making a real difference. And we have many, many other projects to uh, explore there as well, including working with children and young people, as well as training practitioners. So this feels like a level of integration I'd never really imagined from my beginnings and my training in poetry, my experiences of working with Robert, um, both at A level and at PhD. I was set up and trained in a very particular way, and that's changed obviously beyond recognition. But there are connections back. Mum used to tell me how apparently when I was young, I would carry a book around in a pillowcase wherever I went. I don't remember exactly when that was. Um, but I think of that as an image for my relationship to poetry, that kind of need to have meaning close by, so I would have it whenever I need it. And I think my learning of memorising poetry and embodying it is kind of extended that. So if I really integrate the poems that I create and uh, I feel closer to them in that way, um, that feels really important. My work's also moved out into other areas. A wonderful collaboration with the dancer Gemma Collard Stokes, who, when we met, had been interested in bringing writing into her movement practice for as long as I'd been interested in doing the opposite. And we've enjoyed a terrific collaboration. We've made performances. Um, we're developing now a new piece of work with the artist Sabina Kusma. And we meet on a damaged post-industrial landscape in the Peak District, and we make dances in mine shafts, effectively, and we write together and we draw together, and we're thinking about how we can develop a practice that's also about healing our relationship to the landscape from an ecological perspective. So layers of integration, layers of progression, kind of a sense of a new cycle beginning. And this is also into my journey as a therapist. I've just recently qualified as a person-centered counselor. And those ideas have a deep root into Arts for the Blues. Natalie Rogers, who was the daughter of Carl Rogers, who created person-centered therapy, but was also the daughter of Helen Elliott, um, a very talented and accomplished painter, Rogers, Natalie Rogers, took those two profound influences and began to pioneer creative arts therapy in the US. And what I discovered was that she had her own name for this kind of movement between different art forms that I'd been exploring through Daniel Stern's work. She called it the creative connection. And she understood that we could begin a process in a piece of writing or a, piece, or a drawing or a piece of movement, and we could follow it in to another another art form, and that would deepen the process and enrich it. So it's something else I've been coming back to. And in many ways, I think integration is a kind of coming home. And I've been very lucky to enjoy amazing experiences with art and therapy throughout my life. When I first met um, and heard Maggie O'Sullivan read poetry when I was 16, I completely didn't understand it but I felt it was the most interesting thing I'd ever encountered. And I felt that way seeing her as recently as a year ago, reading in Manchester, that this is work that has inspired me for my whole life. Poetry's given me everything in many ways. It's given me those lifelong friendships. It's given me a sense of community. I can see James and Tom, who I ran the other room with, a poetry reading series in Manchester for 10 years. 
Um, it's given me a career, it's given me a livelihood. Dance has also given me many, many different things. It's been about, I think, crucially becoming more flexible, and I don't just mean flexible physically, but flexible mentally and emotionally. Five Rhythms, I think, is very much a practice about learning how to do change. And this is something which I needed to work on quite a lot. I think it's still a work in progress. Um, but it's also given amazing friendships, amazing sense of community, and better health in all sorts of ways. Therapy is another layer into that. Um, the process of my own therapy has led me to be able to integrate and accept parts of myself which are now enabling me to offer therapy to others. And it feels like that journey is really noticing that even though I've had all of these different artistic ambitions and interests my whole life, that, um, what do I want to say here? It's quite a big thing I want to conjure out of the movement. Yeah, it's that poetry has been a well-being practice for me as well. It's not just been about the creative endeavour for the sake of it. It has actually been the thing that's kept me, kept me going, as has dance. So finally, kind of little image of connection between self and world. There's something else that I think are in common between these different areas. Something about the relationship between reader and writer and client and therapist and body and mind and self and world. That's what it feels like is active now that I'm able to bring all of these things together into relationship. And so as I bring this to a close, I really hope that you find something that you can integrate and take with you today. And if you do, let me know. Thank you. Astonishing, an astonishingly integrated uh, um, piece of work. Um, I, d I don't quite know uh, what what to say. So I'm rather <laughs> hoping now we will have a few. Uh, we have a possibility of some questions. Also, I believe from from people online um, that um, somebody will have to. Poor old Scott, he's done all that. He's going to have to answer some questions now. <laughs> but um, uh, so please be kind. <laughs> Oh, there's one there, but I think there's somebody there. Is that a wave or is this? No? <laughs> no? Somebody in there. Okay. Oh, no, there is. Right. There is. There is a hand. So, okay. Uh, we have a microphone that we'll, we'll around you. I think mine still works to find that it's back and dropped it. <laughs> hello, Scotty. It's Matthew Williams. Well, um, hello. <laughs> thank you for the lecture. It's incredible. I just had a thought and wondered, if you feel this type of practice has any application in addressing the uh, political divisions that we hmm. face as a country and the, and the general sense of um, torpitude <laughs> in the country and how that, you know, how that could be applied um, in our in our public life. Wow. Let's uh, <laughs> start with the small questions. <laughs> Um, I mean, my instinct is, is yes, absolutely, I want that to be the case. Um, I guess if I think a little bit more about it, probably where I feel the cutting edge for that now is in my therapeutic work and my collaboration with Vicky and Joanna with Arts for the Blues, particularly this new phase of work we're doing called Arts for Us, which is really opening up or trying to open up creative therapies to young people. Um, and it's really clear that there's an enormous demand that simply isn't being met. Um, it's not being met by CAMS and it's 
voluntary sector organisations are really struggling to cope with a with a huge um, crisis in young people's mental health. And I feel like the neglect of that is political and to address it is political. Um, it's not really a, an issue that we kind of a, come at directly in that work, but I feel that that's kind of an underlying impulse for me. Um, my poetry has always been committed to doing things differently. That's what I've inherited through the scene that I grew up in and through Robert's teaching and work. Um, the idea that poetry can be a place where you, you question orthodoxies of thought and behaviour and belief. And I think dance, the kind of dance I do, I've never formally trained as a dancer. Um, in fact, Simone Forty, who's one of my kind of leading people, um, kind of refused any uh, traditional dance training at a point where that was a really unusual decision to make because she wanted to be able to have a kind of a different sort of movement vocabulary, one that wasn't constrained by a certain kind of discipline or a certain kind of idea. So I guess those challenges to doing things in a kind of acceptable or institutionalized or organized ways, that's kind of where I like to be, like I'm doing a lecture where I'm moving about and, and that's, I couldn't kind of uh, face the idea of delivering a lecture in the way that I might conventionally deliver one. I wanted to kind of make it a challenge for myself and in that way hopefully bring people in in a different way. Um, so I guess that's my politics across those areas and I, yeah, I do want it to make a difference. I think if we can help young people to find a more kind of balanced equilibrium in themselves, then we're ensuring our future. If that can be the biggest ambition I can hope for, then perhaps that's it. Mm. I hope that is equal to the charge of your question. We can talk more about that, I'm sure. Thank you. Anything else? Is there somebody else? There? Hello. Oh. Um, wonderful to be here. It's Vicky. Oh, it's hey. <laughs> yeah, no, I knew. <laughs> I made it all the way from voice. Liverpool. I'm <laughs> pleased I'm here. Um, um, it was wonderful to witness um, a movement um, journey. Um, I guess as a as a dance therapist, I see the movement even if I'm hearing the words. Um, I've been witnessing your journey with us for some time now, and um, it's almost ten years, hmm. um, probably more than ten years now, right? And um, I'm just wondering if if we think about ten years from now in the future you have any sense of where you're going to be and how? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> this is science fiction, science fiction <laughs> question. Yeah, it's like a job interview, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> where do I sign? Um, wow. I know that we've talked, uh, well, I don't know if we've really talked about it, but I've, I've sort of almost inherited it in the air that this notion that our work might eventually change um, policy around frontline mental health treatment in the UK. Um, I mean, we've considered it as a possibility for a long time, but it seems the orthodoxy seems to be to say, oh, that that will take like five or ten years to to get there. So maybe that could be part of that. Um, I know that you've worked for, for many years in association with the different kind of large scale bodies that, that kind of do that sort of work that try and influence policy. Um, I believe it takes a really long time. Joanna's partly engaged now in trying to get funding to do a feasibility study for a randomised <laughs> controlled trial, which is still considered the gold standard of um, clinical evidence. And if we're able to do that, it will be another step along the way. But that's a three year project just to do the feasibility study. So then you have to do the actual study, which also needs funding. And then you have to circulate that evidence and you have, have to persuade policymakers to integrate that. Maybe that'll be quicker, um, who knows? But it's clear at the moment that the therapies that we have available are not reaching everybody. 
and there's a great demand and a great interest in creative approaches to therapy. Um, so that might be part of the hope for it. I kind of want to ask you the same question, really. <laughs> but maybe we can do that over, over something cool and strong. <laughs> so, thank you for the question, Vicky. I don't know if that's enough of an answer. It never seems to be enough, um, but that might be part of the picture. I've been handed a question. Uh -oh. Yes, it's from the ether, uh, which is, <laughs> ah. I don't know who it's from, but is what is the difference between practice and performance in terms of well-being power? Oh my goodness. Yes. <laughs> okay. That's an interesting Practice one. and performance. Yeah, um, so yeah. yeah, I mean, I think there's something about, yeah. I've been reading quite a bit about therapeutic performance, which might be the way I come at that yeah. question. Um, so when people have done, say, a group therapeutic journey and they've dug into their material, they've found ways of sharing and expressing it to each other. They've perhaps gone through a process of integration, which means that they can leave a therapeutic piece of work with stuff that they can use. That's a really important part of our arts for the blues model. We have eight ingredients that didn't really fit the brought to you by the number five, mm -hmm. um, but um, the last two are integrating useful material and experimenting with new ways of being. And I think sometimes um, therapeutic groups will do a performance as a way of resolving or concluding or integrating um, that, that body of work. Um, and I think that potential to be seen, to be witnessed, to kind of go through all of the, the intensity of the, putting on an event involves um, can really heighten a sense of achievement, of integration, a sense of arriving at a specific point. You create a particular moment where that can be realised. Um, so because I guess I think of practice as something that just happens every day. You know, I write every day, I move almost every day. Um, practice is kind of part of my lifeblood and breathing and, and, and daily energy. Um, but a performance is something it feels like, well, actually, I'm looking at James and James is always performing. <laughs> I'm interested in <laughs> or interested in performances that don't look like performances in the conventional way. I guess that's what I'm what I'm thinking about. Um, but I think it's very uh, wonderful and interesting to think of um, performance as a as an event that, that realizes something that can bring something together. Um, in, a, in a powerful way. I'm writing a book about all of this stuff um, and I feel that this is part of that book somehow. Preparing for this has enabled me to figure out all of the ideas that I'm trying to put together in that form and it's sort of in dialogue. Um, so there's a kind of a lot of work going on behind this in, in practice terms that, that realise the performance. So effectively you've, you've heard the whole book mm. now. <laughs> Unfortunately, that's not going to go down too well <laughs> with whoever decides to publish it. <laughs> yeah. okay, I think there's one more, one more question. Oh, Hi Scott, oh, Harriet. Hey Harriet. Um, yeah, Harriet. very simple question, unlike these rather heavy questions you've yeah, been dealing with. I bet it won't be. How do you, no, yeah, just, <laughs> how do you feel about the page these days? Do you feel oh. the page is a place of constraint these days? <laughs> no, I... Yeah, that's a lovely question, but actually I still really love writing poems <laughs> um, and I've got a bunch in the uh, study at the moment that, that need typing up, but they're, they're longhand, there are sonnets amongst them. Um, I've been writing poems about movies recently, just uh, I watch a film that kind of lands with me in the right sort of way, a poem emerges. The poem hasn't really got anything to do with the film, but it somehow being in the atmosphere of that and the way that the page is a kind of container. I think this is the, the way in which I've been thinking about the relationship between uh, creative practice and therapy. There's a lot of talk about the container. The therapeutic container is a place where you can have experiences, you can let things out, you can release stuff safely because you know it's being held. In a, in a secure way. And I think the poem is is like that. 
and I think this is why I'm repeatedly drawn to sonnets. I know lots of people are, but it gives a space for that kind of containment. It can hold all kinds of things. So I think, if anything, I'm writing more on the page than I have for for years. So, yeah, I'm still happy to be there <laughs> as well as wh wherever this is. <laughs> but, um, yeah. Right. Well, that's been a, a wonderful, a wonderful occasion. I think you need this bit of paper oh, at some point. Yeah. And uh, but we're not quite finished. We're not quite finished yet. Um, it's uh, my great pleasure. I haven't actually seen it. Present you with this oh, from wow. the University of Salford. Wow. Well, yeah. <laughs> oh my <That's> goodness. <laughs> wow. Yeah. <laughs> Reminds me of uh, the Superman movie where this <laughs> crystals come out of the come out of the snow. <laughs> I had no idea that was going to arrive. That's um, nor what to do with it. But um, <laughs> I, should, I have a few thank yous of my own. Yeah, can you can you, can you look after it? Yeah, Otherwise, yeah, yeah. I'd do myself an injury. Um, <laughs> I have a few huh? concluding. Thank yous. Um, I tried to get as many of them as I could into the into the talk, um, but a few that, that need to exist in a different space. Um, huge thanks to to Rick um, for kind of holding this event right from the start and making me feel very supported and very encouraged. Um, and Harry as well, who's been out on the front desk and um, the events team have been brilliant. Um, huge thanks to Ash and Ant and Jake, who are all based here in the digital performance lab at Media City and Ash helped to put together the lighting design that we created for this show, which is far more than anything I expected to be doing um, tonight. Thank you to Robert for more than I can say. <laughs> um, and uh, I'm very conscious my mum is here as well. And I'm, yeah, thank you, mum, for more than I can say. These are in no particular order, I should say. My wife is here as well. <laughs> Joanna, thank you for everything as well, for helping me to be here. And um, also special thanks to people who took a quite kind of uh, discreet role in my promotion, shall we say. Hazel Smith and Ian Davidson, I, I thank deeply from the bottom of my heart for supporting my uh, bold move as it felt at the time to to take this next step in my career. And also Anthony Rowland and Emma Liggins, who have been staunch allies of mine since the very beginning of my academic career, sharing an office with Emma at Edge Hill as I began my studies there with Robert and meeting Anthony shortly afterwards and then later working together. And I want to extend that thanks as well to my whole team who I've worked with at Salford for many years now. Um, it's been wonderful to serve you and it's wonderful to see so many of you here tonight. And also the students, past and present, there are a good number of you here as well. It's been a privilege to work with you and thank you for showing up to support me in this event today. I think that's probably everybody, but um, let's enjoy a drink outside and thanks for being here. Oh. There are, um, you know, there are refreshments out out, out, out there in the in, in the foyer. But yeah, let, let's uh, let's say thank you again. Thank you. Thank you.